So the first presentation will be by Ishmael Washid, and it will be on Sufism, scholarly networks, and territorial integration in the early modern Sahara, 1600 to 1800. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank you very much, uh, Usman Khan and the organizer of the conference for having me here for this invitation. It's a great pleasure for me to present some elements of my research on early modern Muslim scholarship and le Islamic law, legal practice in the, in the Sahara and the Sahel. Decades of pioneering historical and philological research have established the pivotal role played by Southern Saharan clerical groups called Zawaya or Tulba in the making of Islamic culture in West Africa. The variegated religious and scholarly traditions that developed from the 15th century onwards among nomads and oasis dwellers in what is today Mauritania, Northern Mali, and Niger have significantly shaped the ways in which West African Muslims engaged with the textual and institutional resources of Islam. In the field of Sufism, one may only think of the large receptions of the Kunta writings or the Saharan roots of the spread, spread of the Tijaniya during the 19th century. Conversely, Saharan ulema were keen observers and commentators of sub-Saharan societies, reflecting on ethnic identities, social hierarchies, and the overarching question of legitimate political rule. In short, the emergence of what one may call a West African approach to Islamic civilization is intrinsically tied to the interdependence of Saharan and Sahelian worlds. The exploration of these shared inter and inter religious and intellectual traditions between Saharan and sub-Saharan societies was furthermore essential in challenging interpretational models inherited from French Islam Noir style colonial historiography and its artifi artificially constructed ethnic and religious boundaries. Yet the remarkable intellectual dynamism that Sahelo Saharan Islam witnessed since at least the 15th century draws on even larger patterns of cultural interaction, which contributed to bridge the gap between the two Africas, to paraphrase Gillen Leiden. We know that since the, lit the, little, uh, the Middle Ages, extensive scholarly networks have connected West Africa to other parts of the Islamic world. These networks became even more important during the 17th and 18th centuries when the multiplication of scholarly and religious centers in the Sahel and the Sahara generated an increasing demand not only for books but also for personal relations with ulama from the Maghreb and the Middle East. In this paper, I will focus on an intermediate level within these trans-Saharan intellectual exchanges which was crucial for both the making of a shared religious and scholarly culture among Saharans and Sahelians and their integration within the wider Muslim world. I'm referring here to a network of scholars and Sufis from the southern edge, edge of the Sahara and the oasis of present-day Morocco and Algeria, so mainly Ouattara, Tafilad, Ouattara, and Tuat. Although this network provided the main conduits through which those books, ideas, and prayers awrat, circulated that proved to be of crucial importance for the re reconfiguration of West African Islam during the late 80s and the 19th centuries, it has received surprisingly little attention from historians or Islamicists. Yet it, yet it was more than a mere prelude to the later rise of the Qadiriya or the Tijaniya, just to speak about Sufism, the scholarly and religious landscape between the southern Morocco and Algeria and the Sahel as unfolded by contemporary literary sources can be usefully compared to what Shahab Ahmed has described in, in the case of medieval Central Asia as, I quote, as distinct intellectual space within which the ulema perpetuated what seems to have been a relatively self-contained intellectual tradition. As such, it offers a different vision of Muslim scholarship and Sufism in West Africa, a vision that, in my view, tends to be overshadowed by the transformation of the 19th century. Following Shahab Ahmed's proposition to remap the Islamic world in terms of intellectual rather than political geography, I argue that in the early during the other early modern period, Relig regionally centered patterns of academic relations developed across the Sahara, putting in touch various autonomous scholarly communities. 
In the case of southern Morocco and Algeria, these communities had emerged during the 15th and 16th centuries in the context of a global restructuring of trans-Saharan space. With regard to the Southern Sahara, we observed <coughs> that in the course of the 17th century, a number of oases such as Shang Wadan, Shingrid, Arawan, turned into major centers of Islamic erudition. While in places where scholarly traditions have already existed since the Middle Ages, like Walata, local literary traditions started to flourish. More bookish in its outlook, since at its center lied the transmission of texts and engagement in scholastic debates, rather than the project of reforming, so reforming society through political action, even though it should be highlighted that the 17th and the 18th century Sahara also had it, its jihads and movements of religious reform, the new intellectual top, top, topography that was taking shape nonetheless provided the cultural background for the great changes of the 19th century. In the marks, remarks to follow, I will mainly draw on the famous biographical dictionary Al-Fatih Shakur fi Ma'rifat Ayan Ulama Takrur, written by the 18th century scholar At-Talib Muhammad uh, Ibn Abi Bakr al-Sadiq al-Bartili al -Bartili, from Walata in present Mauritania. My presentation is divided into two unequal parts. I will be first concerned with the scholarly relations between southern Morocco and the Sahara, the main part will then be devoted to a reconstruction of two trans-Saharan chains of transmission through which the Shedili tradition of the Nasiriya was diffused among local Muslim scholars reaching present-day Mauritania and the Azawad in the course of the 18th century via the oasis of Chwat in southern Algeria. In the 16th and 17th centuries, the Saharan confines of Morocco saw the establishment of a number of zawiyas where the study of Sufism was closely associated to the diffusion of Islamic literacy and law among rural po populations. The best known case is that of the Sufi network found, founded in the middle of the 17th century by the scholar and saint Ibn Nasir al dirqi because of its prominent role in the history of early modern Morocco. Located in the oasis of Tamkrut in the Dra Valley, the Zawiya developed into a vast religious movement that was highly popular among the learned elites of the Alawite state, before it was later eclipsed by the rise of the Tijaniya. Moreover, the Nasiriya became a powerful economic actor specializing in trans-Saharan trade and large-scale irrigated agriculture. During the same period in the neighboring Tafilat region, other scholarly lineages, lineages also became highly influential in promoting the ideal of religious excellence as the synthetic mastery of theology, kalam, law, fiqh, and mysticism, tasawwuf. The development of Muslim scholarly scholarship traditions in the Tafilat has so far not received much attention from researchers. Yet biographical dictionaries, chronicles, and tra or travelogues clearly attest to the significance <coughs> of the region as a place of learning for students from northern Morocco and the Sahara alike. While exploring <coughs> Muslim scholarly culture in the 18th century oasis of Tuat, situated about 400 million miles further south, I quickly realized that most of the local leading Jewish councils cultivated strong ties with their Fileli colleagues. For example, the fatwa collection attributed to a certain uh, Muhammad al-Alim al-Zishlawi contains many questions and anecdotes rel relating to al-Zishlawi's study, study years among scholars in the Tafilat, such as Ibrahim al Yukhaf, Sayyid Jilal ibn Ahmad al-Ahmiyani, or Abdul Wahid al-Qaddusi, and with the Nasiris of Tamrud. An important intellectual figure from Tafilat who, has held, who was held in high, high esteem by Saharan ulama was Hilali, was Ahmed al-Habib al-Lamati. He, he even has his own entry, who, who, was, he, who died in the middle of the 18th century. He even has his own entry in the Fat Shakur. Still today, his writings are prominently featured in manuscript collections across the Sahara and the Sahel. The Fat Shakur preserves furthermore the memory of three former students of Ahmed al-Habib from Walata in Mauritania. About one of them, Muhammad bin Uthman al-Wali, who later died in Tarudant in the Moroccan Sus, we read, for example, quote, then he traveled to the, in, in the quest of knowledge to Sijil Masa, 
where he encountered the pole of his time, Qutb Zamanihi, Ahmed al-Habib al-Zij al-Masi, and he learned from him. It is said that he studied with him the seven, the seven, seven readings of the Qur'an, of the Qira'at. Let us, let us now turn to the trans-Saharan expansion of the Nasiriyah. When writing the history of Sufism as a major religious current attracting large parts of the populations in West Africa, it is commonly contended that things really started only in the second half of the 18th century with the spread of the Qunta Qadiriyah for, for following the remarkable career of Muhtar al-Kunti and the subsequent arrival of the Tijaniyah. Of course, literary sources like the Fatih Shakur leave no doubt that with, within Muslim scholarly circles, the affiliation to Sufism has been a well-established option within the educational curriculum since the very beginning of Islamic higher culture in West Africa, while the practice of ritual invocation of dhikr and religious chanting madh, was, and still is, obviously widespread. Yet, at, at least to my knowledge, no in-depth study has been devoted to the question of how Islamic mysticism was understood and practiced in the Sahara and the Sahel before the Qadiriyah Tijaniyah re renewal and how it related to other parts of the Islamic West. Seen from this perspective, the Fat Shakur provides some highly interesting insights. The evidence I have gathered from diverse biographical entries suggests that the expansion of the Nasiriyah in Morocco was somehow paralleled by the diffusion, diffusion of its doctrines and prayers across the Sahara. We learn, for instance, that at the beginning of the 18th century, the Qadi and Jurist Council Abu Bakr al-Hajj al Isa al-Ghalawi from Walata undertook the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca, in company of the son and successor of Ibn Nasir, Ahmed bin Muhammad, who not only prayed with him during their journey, but also taught him the litanies of the order. There is, however, a, fundament, a fundamental difference in the diffusion of the Nasiriyah in the Sahara and the Sahel if compared to its northern expansion. Well, in the case of Morocco, Tamkrut and Ibn Nasir's descendants remained at the center of the network's activities. The southern spread of the Nasiriyah followed the same patterns of knowledge transmission as in other disciplines of the ilm, traditional Islamic sciences namely through the individual encounter between master and disciple. These encounters eventually led to the establishment of a chain of autonomous zawiyas along the, the central trans-Saharan trade route between Tefilalt and present-day southern Mauritania. But with, the, with the use of the Fat Shakur, I was able to reconstruct two main channels in the transmission of the Nasiri way during the tariqa, during, during the first half of the 18th century. And it's striking to note that in both scholars and saints from the oasis of Tuat were of particular importance. Born in Tsabit in northern Tuat, so one picture from Tsabit, the oasis of Tsabit, Atalib Sidi Ahmed al Twati is remembered as the first to have introduced the Nasiriyah in the oasis of Tishid in southern Mauritania. He was himself a, dis a disciple of Ahmed bin Abdul Qadir Tawustati, a scholar and Sufi from the Zawi of Ibn Ghazi in Tafilalt, who had studied with Ibn Nasir and Tamkrut before emigrating to the southern Sahara. We thus observe again the intermediate role of the Tafilalt Zawiyas in connecting Saharan populations to the Moroccan scholarly milieu. The Fat Shakur further provides us with information about his religious style, combine, combining an, an erudite approach to Sufism with a pietistic posture. We read that he spent every day reciting the first part of the Shahada several thousand times in a solitary cell in a khalwa. Then, I quote, when he finished, he returned to his home and read his books. After this, he conversed with the people of his household. He was continuously engaging with mysticism, in his personal library, you find many books on Sufism and similar topics. Al-Bartili mentions several disciples of Ahmed al from what is today Mauritania, among them some members of his own family. One of the most emblematical of al students seems to have been a certain Atalib Muhammad bin Atalib Umar al-Khattat, who, judging from, from the genealogical chain, the Nisba quoted by Al-Bartili, probably had Tuareg origins. 
Al Khattad apparently was a distinguished scholar in Tishid, in Tishid, specializing in many fields legal studies, theological lo logic, mantiq, grammar, mathematics, hisab, and even occult sciences. Al -Masir. He too was a prolific author of writing scholarly works and commenting on Sufi poetry, where, I quote Al Bartili, his marvelous words on the topic reflect his share in the knowledge of the truth. Haddihi min ilm al the second chain of transmission perceptible in the Fatshakur contrasts somewhat with this scholarly approach to Sufism. It seems closer to models of charismatic sainthood in the Maghrib, which have been extensively studied by anthropologists and historians since the 1980s. At the same time, it hits to an unexplored connection between the diffusion of hagiographical, hagiographical cycles, such as the Shediliya and Asiriya, and the dissemination of Shurfa, Shurfa lineages across the Sahara, the Sahara during the early modern period. On the eve of the rise of, the, of Kunta Sufism in the second half of the 18th century, a Sharifian family whose Zawiya is situated in present-day Regan on the, southern, on the most southern, southern point of Tuat became influential in diffusing, diffusing the Nasiriya in Walata and among the populations of the Haut, of the region around Walata in Mauritania, and the neighboring Azawad. Its origins go back to the migration of a branch of Alawite Shurfa from Tafilai, again the Tafilite region, the Aulad Sidi Hamu bil Hajj, who while engaging in trans-Saharan trade with Timbuktu, settled in several villages in Tuat during the 16th, 17th centuries and grew into one of the most powerful Shurafa groups in the region. So this is one of their uh, oases in, in Tuat. In the late 17th century, one of its members, Mulay Abdullah, established a Zawiya in, in a region and as a celebrated Sufi saint, cultivated a large following in the oasis of southern Tuat and the Azawad. Still today, the annual festival organized in his honor, Ziara, on the 1st of May attracts thousands of visitors. So this is his uh, grave, and this is one picture from, from, the, from the Ziara. Mulay Abdallah's biography, just as the history of his tariqa, still needs to be studied, and therefore, to my regret, I, can only, I cannot say much about it. What is important for my purpose here, however, is that Mulay Abdallah was introduced to the Nasiriya by a Sufi scholar based in the West Saura region, about uh, 450 miles north of Tuat. It was the neighboring region to, to the Tefilan. If we go back to the card, so. It's in the north of Timimun, if you. So this, this scholar, his name is uh, Muhammad bin Abi Ziyan, himself a Sharif Idrisi, claiming descent from the Prophet via one, of the, via one of the founding figures of Moroccan Sufism, Abdul Salam al-Mashishi, you know, the famous uh, Sufi saint, teacher of Ashadili, etc. So you see how these legends connect different places in the Islamic West. Sidi Bouzian, as he is called in local colloquial Arabic, was born in the oasis of Tarid, and after studies in Fez and the Tafilet, had founded its own Zawiya in the small hamlet of Kanetsa, which progressively developed into an autonomous social local Sufi network, the Ziyaniya. Teachings and litanies of the Tariqa were nonetheless those of the Nasiriya, into which Sidi Bouzian had received initiation during his stay in Tafilet. At this stage of my research, I am unfortunately unable to provide more details about the relationship between the two, uh, Maulai Abdullah and Muhammad bin Abi Ziyan, and how the former managed to launch its own Sufi movement in Southern Tuat, which is locally known as the Regania. The picture becomes nonetheless clearer with Maulai Abdullah's son and successor, Mulay Abdul Malik. He has a long entry in the Fat Shakur, where Al-Bartili presents him as an accomplished and charismatic Sufi saint. The biographical notice devoted to Malay Abdullah Abdul Malik in the Fat Shakur draws, draws on many themes that are characteristic of medieval and early modern Maghribi hagiography. Ha ha its devotional praxis centering on the study of the Quran and on individual retreats is considered as ex ex exemplary. He is further described by Bartili as an adept of religious chanting, preaching, and hagiographic stor storytelling. At the same time, he seems to have been much feared by his contemporaries, 
even by his, I quote, brothers and children, as we are told, for his capacity to, capacity to curse, which again constitutes a common mo motive in Islamic ha hagiographical discourse, at least in the Maghrib. Yet, when relating some of his miracles, Karamat, Al-Bartili brings us back to a more specific Saharan setting. We learn about Mulay Abdul Malik arbitrating a violent conflict opposing two Shurfa lineages, lineages in Tuat, or how he miraculously intervened to save the members of a lost caravan from dying of thirst in the Tazaruf Desert, one of the most desolate parts of the Sahara, separating the oasis of Tuat from the Bilad Bakrur. Due to its geographical situation, precisely at the northern terminus of the Tanathruf Desert, the Zawiya of Regen was since its foundation highly involved in mediating relationships between the Tuat and the southern side of the Sahara. The Fat Shakur again provides us with some elements that strongly encourage further investigation on the matter. We are informed that, we are informed that Mulay Abdul Malik has sent one of his disciples probably a family member named Mawlai Zaydan, across the desert to defuse his tariqa. According to Al-Bartili, he visited the Bilad al-Takrur and Walata four times and received an enthusiastic welcome from the local population. Through Al-Bartili's biographical notice, Mulay Zaydan appears indeed as a rather complex and contrasting saintly figure. On the one hand, his religious style mirrors that of his master, Abdul Malik, with regard to his formaturgic capacities and admirative fear, khawf, he inspired to most of his contemporaries. On the other hand, he was deeply involved in local politics, siyasa, competing with powerful Bedouin groups such as the Aulad Daylim, with whom he had even engaged once in open battle near Taudani in the Azawad. The case of the Shurfa Sufis of Regan and the southern transmission of the Nasiriya in general adds, in my view, an important new layer to our knowledge of intellectual exchanges across the pre-colonial Sahara. It illustrates how scholarly and religious affiliation circulated via a network of autonomous centers of Muslim erudition neatly situated along one of the main channels of trans-Saharan mobility from the, later, from the later Middle Ages until the present. It is unfortunately beyond the scope of this presentation to discuss the possible correlation between the decision taken by the leaders of the Regania to diffuse their esoteric and exoteric ilm in the Southern Sahara, knowledge in the Southern Sahara, and their economic investments. Suffice it to say here that the different Tuati fatwa collections, as well as other local sources on which I carried research for my first book, amply attest that the Zawiya of Rigyan, like most of the Zawiyas in southern Tuat, had important interests in caravan trade with the Sahel and, and what is today Mauritania. I conclude. <laughs> <laughs> the aim of this paper was to shed light into the dynamics of intellectual exchange across the Sahara during the 17th and 18th century. The more regional forms and patterns of trans-Saharan <coughs> religious and scholarly relations that I have tried to reconstruct here on the basis of the evidence provided by the Fat Shakur enables us to develop a intimate, an intimate vision of the process through which a shared intellectual space emerged in the Sahelo-Saharan region, which was grounded in an ongoing dialogue between local ulama. The fact that the diffusion of fusion of Sufism within Muslim scholarly circles was a central element of this process is, of course, by no means surprising if considered in the wider framework of early modern Islamic culture. Conversely, the richness of Al-Bartili's notes of saints and scholars allow us to measure the degree to which different, very different forms and practices of knowledge associated with Islam as a religious tradition were mutually interacting, while being rooted, in a way or another, in a profound engagement with texts. This, to be sure, leads us to another topic not to be addressed here. But I would like to finish by emphasizing that the analysis of how Sufism was integrated as both a textual and a pietistic practice within Muslim scholarly culture 
might tell us, might tell us a different story about the way the Sufi Turuk contributed to shaping Muslim societies in pre-colonial Western Africa than the one we are used to read. Thank you. Attention. So we will have uh, questions at the end of the panel presentation. And the next paper is by Alexis Trujillo uh, in the study of mathematics in the Sahel from the 15th to the 20th century. Uh, so, hi, my, my name is uh, Alexis Trouillot. I'm doing a PhD in uh, History of Mathematics uh, at uh, Paris Sets. And um, so, I'm the, at the very beginning of my research, and this talk is going to be a general presentation of uh, what the body of mathematical manuscripts uh, in the region uh, really is. And uh, so, it's very much a work in progress and uh, an history that needs, still needs to be, to be written. Um, so, personally, the initial reason I became interested in mathematical uh, manuscripts of West Africa, I'm, I'm a student of mathematics uh, at first, and um, looking back on the articles written after 2012 and the attacks on Timbuktu, uh, I noticed that kind of a trope of, the, of journalists uh, was to mention that among manuscripts uh, destroyed, uh, were manuscripts on mathematics. Uh, generally, they would say, uh, yeah, yeah, among them, those manuscripts, there is also medicine, astronomy, and, uh, and mathematics. And yeah, as a student of mathematics, I became interested in, in that. Um, so to find further information and kind of tangible information, like name of texts and name of authors, uh, I started to use um, catalog, an amalgamation of the catalog, and uh, score, just call them to, for, um, for anything related to, to, to math. So uh, I mainly use the West African Manuscript Database, uh, the series of Arabic literature of Africa, and, uh, and the MLG, I'm not able to pronounce the German name correctly, uh, of uh, Ulrich Krebstock. And, uh, <laughs> um, and, you, and use that to construct uh, a preliminary, a preliminary uh, corpus of manuscripts. And, uh, and what I'm mainly going to do in this paper is to use uh, and to, is to look from afar and using method of quantitative history to uh, derive research uh, research question and sometimes zooming in on particular text to, to complement. So, uh, all in all, I found uh, 116 mathematical manuscripts, uh, which is not really a very satisfying number uh, because it's both too big to read all of them, and, uh, and it's also too small to uh, use quantitative history to have really definitive answer. You can use quantitative history to have relevant questions, but not really uh, relevant yeah, answers. Um, yeah, so first I would like to talk about the geographical and uh, historical repartition of uh, the manuscripts of the corpus. Um, this is very, very rough uh, because most of the texts are from authors that are not identified, but this is so the, uh, the historical repartition. So the number of texts by uh, century. And uh, you see that it goes crescendo and uh, that the, the yeah, the, the I is in the 20th century. What is also interesting is that uh, the further you, is, um, closer to us you, you are in history, uh, the more the texts are written by local authors. And so uh, the texts of the 10th century are written by, uh, uh, by author in, uh, in Baghdad. Uh, is the text of the 13th uh, that's two Moroccans, uh, 14th, it's, uh, it's from Andalus, and I cannot remember from the top of my head the, the authors. Um, in the 10th century, uh, sorry, in the 18th century, uh, a local production really starts. Uh, there is a text in the 17th century that was written by a local author, but in the 18th century, that's where it starts in earnest. And uh, in the 11th century, there is only two texts that are not from West Africa. And after this, it's only, uh, it's only West Africa and mainly Mauritania. Uh, 
Um, yeah, the fact that it's mainly Mauritania, just very quickly, it's, uh, it might also be uh, an artifact due to the catalogs that I use that are a bit more heavy on the Mauritanian side, but yeah. <coughs> um, um, so uh, a second thing that is interesting is what I mean when I said that those uh, manuscripts are manuscripts of mathematics. Uh, because there are several subjects uh, in mathematics, and um, and they are not at all uh, evenly re uh, evenly matched in the, the corpus. So uh, among the texts of the corpus, only six are not dealing with arithmetic. All the rest is arithmetic. Um, four are dealing with geometry, and. Um, and they are all very exciting. I've read three of them uh, for now. Uh, one of them is a geometry manual that was written in the late uh, 20th century, and I'm going to talk uh, a bit more in depth about it uh, a bit later. Uh, two of them are a commentary of the 10th book of, the, of Euclid's Elements uh, by, um, um, <coughs> by uh, an uh, author from that Baghdad, that's the two texts from the, from the 10th century. And, uh, and one of them I haven't read yet, so sorry. And um, this absence of geometry is, uh, is a bit puzzling for two reasons. Um, mainly because uh, among the texts that uh, we have of geometry, um, those are not texts of beginners. They are written by, by people that know what they are doing. And, um, and the commentary on the 10th book of the Elements of Euclid are very, very hard to do, to, uh, to read, and uses uh, elements from other books of the Elements of Euclid that are found nowhere that I know of in West Africa. But even if they are not found, um, Clapperton, in his second um, trip, mentioned that uh, his, uh, he gave as a gift to Mohamed Bello uh, a copy of the element in Arabic. And the response of Mohamed Bello was that uh, he already had it, but he was <laughs> still thankful for the gift. So, uh, so apparently, the elements of Euclid do exist somewhere in West Africa. But in any case, yeah, they don't seem to be very, um, very widespread. And, uh, and in general, there is no, not much of ge not much of geometry, and um, and this is also um, uh, this this goes hand in hand with the lack of quantitative astronomy. But I'm going to talk about it uh, a bit later. And um, yeah, so for so uh, 110 on arithmetics. Uh, four on geometry, the two other, the two, other, uh, the two last, sorry, uh, are on algebra and are written by, uh, by uh, the, both by the same guy. And I, have, uh, I haven't been able to read them yet, so uh, I don't know, just in the title it said, yeah, uh, so sorry, it's a text on algebra. And um, so now if we focus on arithmetic, um, six, uh, 67, uh, texts are uh, der derivative texts, so versi versification texts uh, who have uh, roughly the same mathematical content, but very different mathematical form. And um, I think that what this can tell us is a uh, tells kind of an indication of the curricul mathematical curriculum, arithmetical curriculum, and uh, I know what uh, everyone. In the, in the region uh, knew uh, if they were doing arithmetics. And uh, the content of, the, on the, of those texts, by the way, don't seem to change too much uh, from, the, from the 17th to the 20th century. And, uh, and a lot of them are, are anonymous, but not, not all of them. Um, so, uh, what do people uh, knew uh, when they were doing arithmetics? Well, the new addition, Subtraction, multiplication, division, and then the uh, the new fraction, an addition of fraction, fraction reduction, and uh, extraction of square roots. And the extraction of square roots is actually uh, interesting because that's what the ten booth of uh, books of uh, Euclid is all about. So 
yeah, it, it might make sense that this particular book of geometry was found in the region, but as of now, I'd, I'd have nothing really conclusive on it. So, uh, second question that we can ask looking at this is that uh, since there is really an accumulation in the 20th century, uh, how the colonial culture kind of affected the, uh, the, 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 the mathematical text produced. And uh, my, well, my response to that is going to be a very elaborated I don't know. And um, so from the French point of view, they pretty much ignored any mathematical production of the region. Uh, when you look at the colonial sources, it's pretty clear. The only mention that uh, people are doing uh, mathematics, it's found uh, in, in 1937. And, uh, and there is this former student of Quranic school that is writing for the French administration a thing, look, that's what they do in Quranic school regarding uh, math, but it's, it's really not, not that much. So yeah, that's the only thing I found. So I don't think that the French were that aware or concerned with uh, what was produced uh, mathematically in Arabic. Um, but the production did continue under colonial rule. So uh, this right here is, um, is, a, is a copy from a, from a manuscript uh, that was written by uh, Al 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 Arawani. And uh, he died in uh, 1987. And, uh, and this is a manual of, uh, of arithmetics uh, very, um, that, is, that is very, that is very uh, interesting and, uh, and very, cla very classical in a way. And uh, so it details uh, addition, subtraction, uh, multiplication, and, j and the text uh, stops just short of division. It's, it's a, only a fragment. And what is also interesting is that at the beginning of the text, he, he, attributes, he attributes the invention of arithmetic to, to the prophets. And, and he's also, and, um, and he's also uh, deta detailing the uses of arithmetic in, tra in trade uh, for inheritance purposes. And, um, and finally, he's quoting uh, authors from, uh, <coughs> uh, he's quoting an, an author from Morocco, another that doesn't be in, uh, able to identify, but that we're writing much earlier. So uh, since it's a fragment, it's a bit hard to be uh, conclusive of if colonial administration really affected this text. But what is sure is that it's still very much grounded in a, in a tra traditional outlook uh, on uh, arithmetics. The, the second text is telling <laughs> pretty much the exact opposite. Uh, so it's a text that I'm currently uh, in the process of editing and that is found in, in uh, Noxhot. And that is the manual of geometry. And uh, that is, it's a very, very dry manual of geometry. Uh, I mean, yeah, the stereotypical uh, mathematical uh, manual, that, that's, that's it. And um, so the first thing that is uh, noticeable that is that it is a manual of geometry, something that is just not found in the, really in the region. And he's talking about things that the other texts of geometry are absolutely not talking about. He's talking about the, the calculus on angles. And uh, in this calculus, he's using uh, the sexagesimal base that, uh, we, that we currently use to calculate angles that is not used in, uh, in other texts. So and he's also using a uh, yeah, picture like this that seems to, de to depict uh, an, an instrument to calculate angles that wasn't used either. So uh, I think for this text, it's very possible that it was actually uh, influenced by uh, the colonial uh, administration. The, um, the vocabulary that he uses uh, um, to describe mathematical uh, object is also pretty peculiar uh, in the context of the region and seem to be uh, closer to what was uh, used in Egypt in the, in, in, uh, in the 1950s. So another, I mean, another way to question uh, what this corpus and what mathematics really, really is and mean, or something that uh, the corpus doesn't really uh, show us, 
is the way maths uh, was used uh, in uh, in the region, and that's that's actually the subject of my PhD. That's what I'm interested in. And um, so, um, for the, for the use of maths, our first use is uh, magic squares. So I saw that <laughs> Ariella was going to talk about it, and uh, she <laughs> she didn't. But um, those are ta used as talismanic artifacts, and uh, basically it's a table. Um, a square table where uh, the numbers of every line, every column, every diagonal uh, add up to the same to the same thing. And uh, and in the region and on, uh, yeah now in the BNF, you find treaties on magic squares detailing. So hey, that's how you do a, a three uh, a three uh, a size three magic square, and then going up 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 up. And uh, yeah, there is a, a very a beautiful example. In, uh, at the BNF. And uh, a, second, uh, a second use is the one that the text uh, on arithmetic straight up uh, give us, that is uh, the inheritance shares. And uh, so I, I have an example for Mauritania and I can show you how we've done. So uh, this is a problem that was given uh, by uh, Sheikh Sidi Al-Kabir. Um, 18th century. So uh, a person died and left behind two, two sons and three hermaphrodites. And what is, uh, what is, the, post what is uh, the share of his inheritance that each group should have uh, on average? So, so um, what is interesting is that he said that, oh, yeah, the box are a bit messed up, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the, the result uh, is this. And, um, and this is a very, very uh, nice <laughs> result. <laughs> because um, what, he, what it does, um, I think I have a slide, actually, that does it for me somewhere. Yeah, that's messed up too. Okay. <laughs> so uh, the fractions are actually uh, symmetrical. Um, that means that the only differences are this. Here it's a three. Here it's a five, and this. It's a, here it's a minus, here it's a plus. There are a no, uh, another thing that is interesting, that they have an internal structure. So here, there is a five, here there is a five. Here I turn five, here I turn five. And, uh, and last thing, they are beautiful, but they're also weird, because there is this. Here there is a five, and here there is a five. So it means that it's super easy to simplify the fraction. And the presenting like this is a deliberate choice. I mean, there is, there is no way that he, uh, he, didn't, he didn't see it. And uh, the way that Sheikh Sidiya frame is, uh, his answer is, also, is very interesting. So basically, he's doing uh, this whole development on how to calculate the, the shares. Um, it's detailed in the paper, it's not really important here. And in the at the end, he say he gets to this result for for the sums. He gets to these results, and afterward, he says, "Well, this can be decomposed like this, okay." And then he skips these steps and say, "This is this," which is absolutely not obvious, because <laughs> because if you use the standard method that is found in the other text of reducing a fraction, you get to this result. That is, yeah, that, that's beautiful, it must be said. And after this, uh, what he does is that he say, well, 40 is, uh, 40 is 5 by 8, I mean, it's not written in the fraction, that's what I assume it is. 40 is, uh, is 5 by 8, and it, it, uh, it gives this, it gives this. And same, same deal here, and it appears to this. So what it shows, I think, is a deliberate, uh, a de a deliberate uh, push to have uh, an aesthetic, aesthetically, sorry, pleasing uh, solution. And the fact that this is hidden, technically, in the text, I think all, also might suggest that there was a kind of a pride in the manipulation of number associated with it. Uh, so yeah, for the hermaphrodites, it's um, 
it's kind of the same thing. Um, the only thing that is um, to note is that uh, here, when you simplify the question, you actually find something that is perfectly fine. So he really artificially multiplied by five to, have, to, to preserve the symmetry, right? Another thing about this procedure, though, is that uh, it's not only pleasing and everything, it's, uh, it's really not obvious to find the initial de decomposition, this, this one, uh, because this appears in this previous calculation, and so I, I think he knew that he was going to arrive at, the, at this uh, result, but this, the 12 and the, and the 20, 25, 20, I, I don't, I don't know of a very simple way to arrive to, to such solution. So I think that this, this text that is classified as a legal text uh, should really be, uh, should really be um, studied in deep by uh, historian of science. And um, yeah, I think I'm going to stop, to stop here so on my presentation on this corpus. I can just tell, tell you how I ended up uh, navigating it for, for my actual PhD. Um, basically, I took uh, factors that had nothing to do with math, nothing to do with anything else. Um, I'm using, uh, I'm working on a tribe. They wrote several mathematical texts uh, across, um, across the years and across different subjects. And just by using it, yes, that's how I discriminate the text that I'm actually going to study uh, very much in depth. Yeah, so thank you. I just want to share what for me was a delightful moment in Alexis's paper, and uh, I'll quote what he said that it was super easy to simplify the fact <laughs> the fraction, and that he didn't do it as a choice. I'll take his word for it that it was super easy. <laughs> <laughs> and then another point where he said, oh, it's absolutely not obvious. Well, since the super easy wasn't obvious to me, <laughs> this thing that is absolutely not obvious seems super easy to me. <laughs> and then I would just say, oh, that when he was commenting on the push for the aesthetically pleasing solution, there was a moment when Alexis commented on the mathematics as being beautiful but the combination of his words and his smile for me was aesthetically pleasing. And one of the things that I would say, oh, uh, I wish I had studied mathematics. So. All right, our last paper is, will be done by technological marvels. And so it will be coming from uh, the University of Alberta in Canada but via uh, Skype. And it is Abu Bakr Abu uh, Qadir on the verse tradition, Muslim scholars, and transmission of Islamic knowledge in Mauritania, the land of a million poets. And just like Alexis said, it's super easy to <coughs> simplify the fraction. I'm assuming that it's super easy to run the Skype, but I have no idea if it is or not. Okay, so. It'll be about a minute. Well, I can't see anyone. It's as if I will be talking to myself. <laughs> uh, hello everyone, uh, thank you Professor Hoffman Khan for the invitation and uh, thank you Norbert for uh, the logistics and uh, the underground works as well as uh, Dennis, uh, thank you so much. Uh, the initial plan was for me and uh, Dr. Obunaike to be in uh, Cambridge, they have uh, a full plate of chicken, full chicken, as we used to pack in the car. Uh, but thanks to the U.S. Embassy here for not making it happen. Uh, so my paper is a uh, vast tradition: Muslim scholars and transmission of Islamic knowledge in Mauritania, the land of uh, million poets. <coughs> so I'll start my paper uh, with a personal experience because uh, it is uh, one of the reasons for. Uh, my PhD project. So, uh, over a decade ago, I uh, left Damascus, Syria, for Mauritania, where I would end up spending several years as a student of sacred knowledge. I had the honor and privilege of studying in the Bavaria, one of several villages in Mauritania that is home to a celebrated uh, traditional center of Islamic learning. On one occasion, uh, 
uh, a friend, uh, Abdul Malik, uh, a French student in the Mahbara became ill. And in line with the Islamic etiquette guiding the right of the sick on their family, friends, and neighbors, one of our teachers, upon hearing of the student's illness, visited him. After some minutes of sitting with the patient, the Sheikh made uh, a very short uh, supplication for the student and uh, requested us to bring uh, a pen and paper. So uh, upon delivery, he looked up for a second, for a few seconds, then uh, brought his pen on the paper, scraped them on him as we worked. After he finished writing, he extended it to my sick friend. We found out that the Sheikh had composed some short poetic verses uh, in the Rogers meters. The verses were about the student's state of health, and uh, he was asked in uh, God to heal him. So as, as funny that as some of us were, like myself, who wasn't used to that kind of uh, thing, uh, of the Sheikh's composition of verses uh, in beautiful prosodic form, we memorized the verses immediately. Uh, the first two verses read, and I'm not going to read this in the Mauritanian uh, style, it says, not do before the Maliki Shifa and the Abdul Maliki, so, in the top translation, it means uh, we hope uh, in the graciousness of Almighty to the sovereign king that he heals Almighty and may his very place continue to exude pure, sweet fragrance. So, the same kind of scenario repeated itself at a later point, but this time around it was with another teacher of mine and myself of the sick person. I encountered many other experiences during my stay and visits to different people in Mauritania and came to realize that the tradition of verse is a fixture in the lives of Mauritanians. So Mauritania is synonymous to the tradition of poetry and versification, hence the, the name Balad Bijouin Shahid, which means uh, the land of middle poets. Uh, the country is divided between the north and the west Africa, with both regions comprising a cultural zone. This country is famous for a recent discovery in the Arab and Muslim worlds uh, for the incredible quantity and quality of her poets and poetry. Uh, it is rare to find a Mauritanian who has not memorized poems, and uh, even rarer uh, for a Mauritanian scholar without a collection of poems. So, book introductions and forwards, religious and pedagogical texts, pandemic works such as Medh, Exegesis of the Quran, polemics, and uh, even correspondences in our side are justified or written in poetic forms in many parts of Mauritania. This tradition of verse in Mauritania reportedly emerged comparatively late in the 17th to 18th century. Uh, this was at the time similar poetic traditions were becoming marginal in other Islamic regions such as North Africa and the Middle East. Mauritania saw a paradigm shift in the intellectual production away from prose. Major scholarly texts and jurisprudence, logic, and mysticism were transformed into poetry. New poetic compositions fed a flourishing literary production. This poetic journal will later dominate and characterize Islamic scholarship since the last centuries. And my, question, my questions are how and why did this uh, desert country emerge as one of the most prolific poetic cultures of the Islamic world? What impact did this development have on the articulation of Islam in a moment of intellectual and political transformation in West Africa, often known as the age of jihad? So did the debates over linguistic prowess uh, between the, and the genealogical lineage between the Arab Hassani and other Mauritanian social and ethnic group shape the emergence of this tradition? So my paper is uh, is part of ongoing research trying to investigate the emergence of a classical Arabic verse tradition of Mauritania and its characteriz characterization of Islamic scholarship. Here, I talk of verse tradition as a poetic journal. So, this includes Shia, uh, no versification, and others. So, as for my use of the term tradition, I do not mean it in the sense of an unchanging or static entity, but rather something. Uh, that through struggle goes through continual transformation as it is transmitted. My interest here is in, the, in understanding some of the questions I asked earlier. To do this, I attempt situating the emergence and establish, establishment of that tradition in Mauritania as a social tradition, and I locate its emergence in a specific geographical as well as social context. 
Because for us to understand its impact in, this, in the religious, intellectual, cultural, and political spheres, we must bear in mind the fact that the tradition developed, transformed in, and was transformed through different contexts. So I'll set the stage uh, by introducing that, making us understand the 17th century. So to understand the paradigm shift in Mauritania's uh, literary and intellectual sphere, particularly the shift to the verse genre, it is important to draw attention to the era of its emergence and some of the factors that led to it. So a brief journey to 17th century Mauritania, the context of its reported emergence is in order. 